All right, welcome back to Naples Baptist Temple. Let's all stand and sing number 374 this evening. Number 374. We'll sing Send a Light, all four verses of number 374. Let's sing. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay, send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light. And a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Amen. When you walk in late, you don't know what verse you're singing. All right, let's go to the word, the Lord in prayer this evening. Father, thank you for this day, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that uh, you've enabled us, and you've... Uh, you've uh, uh, commissioned us to send the light. And Father, thank you for letting us take part in uh, worldwide missions, being a part of your ministry, being a part, Lord, of the gospel work. And I just thank you for that. And Father, I pray that you would help us as we uh, go forward today, as we study this first institution, the family, this night. And I pray that you would just bless. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's see number 410. Number 410. Faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye soldiers, Christian, rise and press the battle ere the night. It will the glowing skies against the foe in bells below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory. That overcomes a world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shots of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory. 
victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up on dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall we give. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light our hearts will love a flame. We'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Um, Brother Bolin, will you lead us in prayer this evening? Um, well, this evening, before we move on, I did want to uh, announce a few things. Uh, first of all, we have our faith promise cards. Does anybody need a faith promise card that hasn't had one yet? Or um, We can just pass them out. We have a stack of them up here. And if anybody needs one, uh, we'll just raise your hand. Anybody? All right. Well, we... Uh, what was that? Oh, nothing. Okay, so right now, our faith promise to date, now we have another week, is $17,312 that will be promised for the year 2022. That's $17,312. I uh, just wanted to announce that. That's where we are, so do keep that in mind. Uh, time change will be next Sunday. Time change is next Sunday. So um, no matter how, which way it goes, it's always a hassle, but time change is next Sunday. Um, yeah, so just so you know about that. All right, I wanted to do this real quick. Uh, I almost forgot. I got this back on February 14th and read it and thought about it and prayed about it, and and um, it seemed like the Lord just laid it on my heart. But I wanted to bring it before the church. Uh, we used to do, Karis and I used to do the Hope Addictions Recovery Program, uh, run that at Berean Baptist Church. We, I feel like it's a needful ministry. It's for addictions recovery. It's very uh, good ministry. It's church-centric. It is not a uh, big hierarchy or, you know, a big uh, to-do ex extra church organization. Pastor Rick Carter, who will be preaching our missions conference next year, uh, Pastor Carter created it, and it was a, uh, it just was a blessing to us, and he gives it away. There's no charges. It, he just writes it. His only, you have to sign up for it, and you have to basically promise not to change it and use it for your own purposes. You know, that would be natural, but it's totally free. Um, and you can buy printed copies of the stuff if you want, uh, but you could just print it out yourself. And so we did it. It stands for Helping Others Put Off Entanglements. I think I preached through uh, the Bible Truths of Hope. And um, 
But he sent out this email, and it says that they are trying, they desire to produce professional quality videos and documentaries on counseling and addictions topics. Now, I can't tell you how much this is needed nowadays uh, to be able to take videos and, and just understand things, particularly things from a pastor's perspective, just videos on counseling and things like that uh, are huge helps. He says that all videos will be free to all HOPE members and churches. Again, to be a HOPE church, you basically sign up on their website and say, I'd like to be one, and they say, okay, it's totally free. So the counseling videos for HOPE students are to help them deal with real life issues. Uh, there'll be HOPE training videos for HOPE program workers. Uh, so to do that, they're trying to buy some professional video equipment. Uh, and they're going to expand a little bit. Right now, it's been primarily, and now it could be used for anything, but I hope right now is primarily, um, you know, drugs and alcohol, I think, is probably what you'd say is their real, uh, where they've been focused. But with these videos, they're going to expand into other topics, such as emotional trauma, pornography, guilt, and other products or other topics that uh, help people uh, where we minister. So the financial goal uh, that they want to raise money for the program, of course, it's all on a shoestring. It's all out of one church. It's not a very big church either. It's not like there's some mega church. They probably have maybe 300 people that show up on Sunday morning. It's not like a big church. Um, but they're trying to wait, raise $12,000. And um, I would like to give them as a church $1,000 just to help them buy this equipment and produce these videos. Um, so it's not necessarily a business meeting. I think this is ministry. We're not necessarily uh, dealing with, you know, renovating the buildings. So, but I just wanted to bring that before the church. Does anybody have any questions about that? Um, so um, we'll just take a simple vote. Well, I, don't think, I don't think we need to open up a business meeting. Just take a simple vote. All those in favor of just supporting the ministry with $1,000, just raise your right hand and say amen. 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 All right. Um, just to make sure it's all from us and not just from the preacher, but uh, we'll uh, send that to him and uh, to the church. And I'll be here. This is Brother Dice's church, too, our missionary that we just took on a couple months ago to England. So this is Brother Dice's church that is uh, doing that. So, all right. Well, that's Evan. I think we have a third song, and then there's our what? Okay. All right. Next, we'll do number 411. Number 411, hold the fort. 411. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. On the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signals By thy grace we will See the mighty host advancing Satan leading on Mighty men around us falling Courage almost gone On the fort for I am coming Jesus signal still Wave the answer back to heaven By thy grace we will See the glorious banner waving Hear the trumpet blow In our leader's name will triumph over every foe on the fort for I am coming Jesus signal still wave the answer back to heaven by thy grace we will fierce and long the battle rages but our help is near. Onward comes our great commander. Cheer, my 
my comrades cheer. On the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven by thine grace. This time we have a prayer letter from the Mallards, a.k.a. Papa-in-law. Um, it says, Dear pastors, churches, and prayer partners, I want to start this update with praising the Lord for his provision and protection as we have traveled over two years on deputation. In a way, it seems like yesterday that we began, and then sometimes it seems like it's been forever. We've been in some great churches and have met some wonderful people. We are so overwhelmed at the amount of people who have committed to pray for our family and the churches who financially support us as we prepare to go to Australia. While we have met some wonderful people along the way, my heart longs for the day when we can minister to a group of people, be a part of a community, and seek to influence those people with the gospel. Our prayer and desire is that day would come sooner rather than later. Until then, we will be faithful where he has us. Our travels in January and February took us to churches in uh, in (laughs) North Montana. (laughs) Uh, What's NM? New Mexico. Close. Uh, Arizona and Indiana. We were blessed to be able to have a a part in three missions conferences during this time. As a result, the Lord has led uh, five of these churches to partner with us in reaching Australia. This has taken our support level to over 90%, for which we are both overwhelmed and amazed. It shouldn't amaze me simply because of the God we serve. He truly does abundantly above what we uh, can ask or even think. Our desire is to be heading to the field by late spring or early summer. This is a matter over which we have no control. As I sat to write the rough draft of this letter at the last day of February, Western Australia still had their borders closed to international travel. I'm happy to report that as of today, they have lifted this restriction and are now receiving international travelers. Hopefully this will help in the approval of the visa as well. We've begun to communicate with an uh, immigration agent in Australia to help us, uh, to try and help us with this process. There seems to be uh, changes almost daily and it's already been a help having their counsel and insight. We currently have two Australian pastors who are working on our behalf. Hopefully, by the next update, I will be able to report some progress. Our family is doing well. We are still adjusting to Taylor not being with us. We miss her, and but, but we're happy she's serving the Lord with Evan. My wife and girls have been such a blessing through our deputation travels. Our youngest, Raya, thinks she has houses and apartments all over the U.S. Thanks again for your prayers in our, uh, for our family. We continue to pray that the support and the visa process would come together at just the right time. Please contact me if you'd like uh, like us to share the burden of God uh, that God has placed on our hearts for the people of Western Australia. To those who pray for us and support us financially, we look forward to uh, representing you on the field of Australia as soon as possible. In Christ, the Mallards. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for the Mallards to Western Australia. Dear Lord and Holy Father, Lord, I pray that you would just put your hand on my father-in-law. Lord, I know he's doing your work. Lord, please bless him as he uh, seeks to uh, get more uh, uh, support for you. Lord, I pray that you just uh, put your hand on, uh, on him and uh, guide his footsteps. Lord, I pray that you would just get him to the mission field as soon as possible. Lord, I know you have a great work for him um, um, in Western Australia. Lord, I pray that you would just um, uh, show him the right path to take and uh, bless his every move. And uh, just my prayer. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Well, I asked Evan if he would, uh, he he wanted to read a missionary letter. Uh, We were going to do one Wednesday night, but uh, I just felt it'd be better to read the Mallard's letter tonight uh, so Taylor could hear it. All right, so family matters. Uh, Number nine, orderliness of the family is where we're going to be tonight. Uh, We had the objective of the family last week. And that was number eight, uh, the first in the O's of these, this group of messages. Tonight, the orderliness of the family. And uh, so we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1 to begin. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Uh, we're going to use this to kind of launch out. We're going to use this to illustrate a point. 
and then branch out and start talking about a few things that in a family that God has designed to be orderly. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. You're going to say, this is just the strangest passage of Scripture for a family that, no, this isn't a typo. I actually intended to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that means pastor or shepherd or elder, bishop, he desireth a good work. So first of all, it is, it is a good thing to desire to be a servant to God. It's a good thing. Because not only that, when we get down to verse number 8, it says likewise. Likewise. Speaking about deacons. It's a good thing to desire to do more work, desire to do good work for God. That's okay. Verse number 2. A bishop must then be blameless The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, (laughs) not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation, fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So, a pastor's household, a pastor's home, in this case, um, you know, this is very convicting for me for obvious reasons. But it's a, a it, 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 God has shown us the design of something that is an orderly thing. The home is meant to be orderly. Let's go on in verse number 8. Speaking of a deacon. A deacon, likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let, those, let these also first be proved, then let them be Uh, Let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree. In other words, it's good. Once again, this is a good thing. God's saying that this is a good thing. And great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. We should desire, all of us should desire to be servants to God. We should all desire to be servants of God. But service, any kind of service, and I'm speaking directly here, we've looked at a passage about pastors, we looked at a passage about deacons, but the principles remain that service, that we should all desire it, but service comes from orderliness, orderliness, following the rules, following the principles, following the precepts of the Word of God, orderliness. A Christian home should be a little preview of heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness. Lord, help us as we go through this, Lord, uh, and we learn more about your design for the home. And Father, I pray that you'd bless. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, to begin with this evening, uh, on the subject of orderliness, let's look first at the original orderliness. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. If you're building a house, you don't start with the roof. Because it's not going to work. It can't just hang in the middle of the air while you build the rest of the house. You start with the foundation. Usually you start with a lot of stuff. If you've ever watched any big commercial buildings being built, and I know Brother Kent can tell you a little bit about that, they start with all the horizontal work first. I mean, they're doing stuff under the ground. They're sinking culverts. They're managing water. And it looks like they're just making a big mess and a big mud hole for months when you see one of these big commercial developments. It's because they're doing all this stuff that's actually underground. 
And when they get all of that done, that's when they start building up. They're doing things decently and in order because they've got to. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have an objective. And you've got to put things together in the right way. If you bake a cake, you can't just throw all the ingredients in a bowl and shove it in the oven. You've got to follow the recipe. I don't know how to bake a cake. I could probably read the, you know, if you buy one of those boxes. I'm not going to make one from scratch, but if you follow, buy one of the boxes, I could probably put an egg or two in there or whatever else it takes and mix it up. I could probably do that. But I know that it doesn't happen unless you follow the instructions. It doesn't work right. You have to have an orderliness in it. Things have to be done decently and in order. God is a God of order. He absolutely is. Everything around us testifies that He is a God of order. Now, I'm not talking about our society and our disorderly, rebellious mankind. I'm not, talk I'm not even talking about the fall and sin's curse. But even under this sin-cursed world, you still see order. Order, God's order. Moons orbit planets. Planets orbit stars. Stars arrange themselves in galaxies. Wouldn't it be strange if the earth orbited the moon and the sun orbited all of that? That would be weird. It would be out of order. What if it happened just randomly? Some planets had moons, other stars had I mean, it just... You, it's, it's, it would be out of order, but we have a God of order. Think about ice and water and vapor, water vapor. You know, if, if you've got a boiling pot of water, it doesn't produce ice cubes. You know, if you put water on a stove and turn the heat up, it doesn't start sprouting ice cubes. That would be weird, wouldn't it? It would be out of order. Because there is an order that corresponds with temperature. Heat produces vapor. Cold produces ice. Room temperature produces liquid water. That's just orderly. Anything else would be a little weird. Day follows night. And night follows day. And so forth and so on. Has anybody ever had two nights right in a row? I, I felt like it occasionally. Sometimes when the kids were sick when they're little, it feels like you went through about three nights in a row without any days in between. But I've never actually had that happen. Day has always followed night. And night has always followed day. It doesn't just happen at random. There's an order to it. What I'm saying is God's a God of order, and we see that testified all the way around. Birth, life, death comes in that order. Anything else would be a little strange, wouldn't it? Now, God is a God of order. He says, let everything be done decently and in order. He certainly follows that himself. Now, let's first look at some order. The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is in order in the sending. What am I talking about? Well, John 20, 21 says this. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The Father sent the Son. Jesus Christ then in turn sent the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. That's the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So in the sending, there is order in the Godhead. The Father sent the Son. The Son sent the Holy Spirit. There is an order in these things. There is an order in the sending. The Godhead is in order in the sending. By the way, the Godhead is also in order in our praying. In our praying. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 8. The Godhead is also in order in our praying. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Romans 8, 26, the Bible says this, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Bible here talks about a time when you don't even know how to pray. There's something so uh, that, that weighs upon your heart to such an extent that you don't even know how to put words around it. Sometimes, when in certain situations, I felt like I don't know what to ask God for. I don't know if the, you know you see two people that are in an argument and you don't is God. I can't pray that somebody wins the argument, but I just can pray God help. Help? I don't know how to ask. I don't know what to ask for. We pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We also pray in the name of the Son. John chapter 14, verse 14 says this, If ye ask anything in my name... I will do it. Jesus has said several things like that throughout the Gospels, and by that we know that we should pray in Jesus' name. So we end every prayer. But it's by tradition, but it's also by mandate. God told us to pray in His name. Jesus Christ said, pray in my name. So we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of the Son, but we also pray to the Father. I'm skipping through a little bit of this pretty quickly, but we'll get to some additional things here in the middle, just because I'm trying to point out that God is a God of order. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, the Bible says, you know this one, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ says, if you pray, ask anything in the, my name, he says, ask in my name. So we pray in His name, and we pray to the Father. We reflect that order of the Godhead in our prayers. Jesus told, tells us, the Bible tells us of the order of the Godhead in the sending. We reflect that in our praying. I'm just saying that God is a God of order. There's no surprise to us when we say that God is not only the God of order, but He's the author of orderliness. So I'm saying that he is the original in orderliness. But let's tie this back down to the family. Since we're, sub we're studying the family tonight, there is also a biological orderliness. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 27. I'm going to start going through the book of Genesis in Sunday school as soon as we're done with the judges. Um, going through the book of Genesis in Sunday school. And so we'll be studying this in greater detail. Uh, but Genesis chapter number 1, verse 27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, I've harped on it quite a few times, but there is such a thing as male. There is such a thing as female. It isn't a choice. It's a biological imperative. People can get their minds warped around all kinds of different ideas and concepts, but the reality is there is a biological indicator that you will carry with you from the moment of conception till past the day you die that says you are either male or female. Now there are, because we live in a fallen world, there are a few biological mutations that are exceptions. Very few, but a few. That's not what the culture is talking about right now. Just so we know. Now, God says that He created male and female, but look at this in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. Genesis 
Chapter 2, by the way, is what I, what I like to call as additional exposition or kind of an explosion. He tells us in chapter 1 that he created male and female, and then chapter 2, God goes into a little bit more detail. He expands out a little bit to give us some of the details about that. And here is one of them in verse number 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now, if Adam was alone, we can, and then we read in a few minutes that then Eve was created, I think it's pretty easy for us to say that Adam was created first. I mean, that just seems logical to me. And so Adam was alone, he was created first, and so God said that he was going to create an help for him. Look at uh, verse number 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. What the Bible's saying there, and I think God was doing this on purpose, God was trying to show Adam something because God, it's not, that, it's not like God designed the idea of femaleness or femininity or, or a female creature. It's not like there was just male lions up until this point. It was not like there was just male giraffes up to this point. God brought all the, Adam, all the animals in front of Adam and there was a male and a female lion. And there was a male and a female giraffe. And there was a male and a female warthog. And that male warthog thought that female warthog was pretty gorgeous. You ever seen a warthog? Only a male warthog would find the female warthog pretty gorgeous, but that's the way God designed it. But Adam's there going, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Well, I'm, well, I'm, 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 okay, God. <laughs> and, you know, I don't even know, you, you, it, it, I'm not going to try to read into Adam's mind and try to say what he was thinking, but he had to realize something's up. And God caused him to fall into a deep sleep. And we know the story that God took Adam's rib closed up the skin, the, the, his side thereof afterwards, and formed Eve. Adam was made out of mud. Eve was made out of recycled mud. She was taken from Adam. That's what the idea of female was, from male. Woman taken out of man. And help that was designed expressly meet for his needs. Perfect. Not a bone from his head, so he, she would be over him. Not a bone from his foot, so he would be trampling over her. But a bone from his side, under his arm, so that they could be side by side and he could protect her. That's God's design. And it's orderly. It is orderly. It's beautiful, and it's orderly. Now, by the way, the idea of from in the female and the woman, and the idea of the word and help, they are not diminutive. Any more than it is diminutive or demeaning for God to call us His servants. We are all in some way in service or under authority to someone else. The idea of help is literally that, that the family has an objective and the man couldn't do it alone. He needed someone to help him. Children, now get this, now this is, this is really deep theology. There was Adam, then God created Eve. And then, and only then, do you find in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, 
and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again his brother Abel. I'll just stop right there. My point is, you had Adam, you had Eve, then you have children. It's orderly. It would be kind of weird if Cain and Abel showed up first. As babies, who would take care of them? But no, no, God created Adam and Eve in their adulthood, just like He created everything else on earth, by the way. God didn't plant an oak tree by a seed. Everything was formed in its adulthood, including the stars in the sky and the light from those stars already in transit. Don't listen to these evolutionists say, well, the earth couldn't be only 6,000 years old because the light from the stars couldn't get here in that amount of time. No, no. He created everything in its adulthood. He is more than capable of putting the starlight in transit from those many light years distant stars to here. More than capable. God created all. He even said there would be minor lights in the night sky, didn't he? It would be weird for him to say that and then not put them there. No, God's a God of order. God's the God of order. And the things that he does, the creation he made is beautiful. Beautiful. He even called it good before the fall. Now listen, after man and woman were created, then there were children. Now let me blow your mind for just a minute. Men and women are biologically different. It's true. There is a difference in the physical makeup between a man and a woman. Now, I'm not saying it's true in every case. I've seen some pretty tall and muscly women that I would be kind of scared to mess with. I've also seen some very tiny little men. There are variations, I'm not saying that it's... But in general, a man has more body mass, a man has thicker bones, a man has more muscle mass than a woman in general. God made us that way so that we could be protectors. Not so that we could beat anybody up or, or in some way abuse a woman, it's so that we could protect a woman. Now, women... While men have a physical makeup, women have a much more highly developed emotional makeup. And that's a plus, by the way, because most of us as men are pretty dumb emotionally. You don't have to be married very long to know that. There are things that are happening on an emotional level that my wife is in tune with that I simply don't see. She'll say things like, did you see that she was, something was wrong tonight? I didn't notice anything. I did, but she did. That's a help to me. Now, in the other instances, people talk about physical, people don't talk about the physical and the emotional makeup, and the difference is there enough. But let me go ahead and hasten to point out that in it, intelligence, I think that men and women are equal, completely equal in intelligence, but by the way, the methodologies by which we employ that intelligence can be vastly different. Men are not multitaskers. I don't care who says they are, men cannot think about more than one thing at a time. We're very task-oriented. We want to get this thing done. Women can think about everything at the same time. Uh, it's just different. It's just different. I'm just saying that God has created us biologically different. There is an order in that biological creation. So we see the original orderliness. We also see that there is an, an indicative biologically, or biological orderly, orderliness, and it's an imperative. And then there's also, though, a scriptural orderliness that must be paid attention to in the family. If you would, turn to James chapter 4. 
not having you flip around too much tonight, but I think this is an important one to take a look at. James chapter 4 and verse number 6. James chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says this, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. By the way, we're never told to fight the devil. We're not capable of it, but we are told to resist the devil and then he will flee from us. Now, the point of this is to say that there is a scriptural orderliness that applies to homes, but before we start talking about husbands, wives, and children, let's go ahead and remember that it is imperative that we all submit ourselves to God. That we are all required as Christians by the way, even lost people, although they do not accept it yet, they will. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They may not accept it now, but it is imperative, it is required even of the lost that they submit to God. We just have the blessing of being able to do it now as saved people. Submit yourselves to God. That means whatever that book says, I've already said, okay, God, too. Now, there's a lot in that Bible that I may not know. I, hopefully, there's not a lot, but there's certainly some things that I don't know that God has told me to do. Lord, grant that He'll tell me to make me understand. But here's the thing. I've already said yes. I've, I, I'm giving God full permission to tell me what to do. I hope you have too. That doesn't mean I always do and I'm always successful in it. I just mean I'm just standing here as a Christian saying I already have to accept what God says. Whatever He says to do, that's my job, to submit myself to Him. So the point is that we are all to submit to authority. God's authority first. Also to scriptural authority. Hebrews 13, 17 talks about, talks about pastors. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You know, I have to give an account to God for where this church goes and what happens. But there is an authority... Uh, that we must submit to. We must submit to all authority. All must submit to God. All must submit to spiritual authority. Here's another one. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. All must submit younger to elder. 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. There he says it again. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble that the elder, that the younger submit themselves to the elder. That's not just talking about any random older person. That's talking about fellow church members. That's talking about spiritual wisdom. That's talking about having a little humility to say, maybe I don't know everything quite yet. And that's good for your pastor, that's good for anybody. I've said this before, but you know, when I was about 17 years old, my dad didn't know anything, and over the next five or six years, I found out he got a lot smarter. The reality was he didn't change, my attitude changed. There was a lot of wisdom there that I had rejected as a lost person, that I could tap into later on. 
My dad wasn't a very spiritual man. My dad wasn't a very consistent church-going man. Brother Moore talked to him at great length several times and thought that my dad was saved. I honestly hope so. But here's the thing. When the car was making a funny noise, do you know who I called? My dad. When I didn't know how to do something, like whatever it could, you know, I called and asked dad. Why? Because he had some wisdom. He had some experience that I didn't have yet. Younger, submit yourselves to the elder. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that there is a scriptural orderliness in submitting. We submit all to authority. We submit all to God. We submit younger to elder. And by the way, that 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another. We are all to be accountable to each other as a church. I mean, we're supposed to be holding each other up to a high standard. Looking out for one another. Praying for one another. Christians also are to submit themselves to civil law that doesn't violate God's law. Let me put that in there as a caveat. If civil law violates God's law, we are to go back to the first priority, which is to submit ourselves to God. Fair enough? But the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, and he goes on and talks about it, but we're to submit ourselves to the ordinances, the laws of man. We're to be good citizens. As far as we can, within the bounds of the biblical requirements placed upon us, the commandments of God, we should be the best of citizens. Once upon a time, our country believed it was so, that our Constitution was wholly inadequate to govern anyone outside of a biblical Christian. That's changed. But we shouldn't. We should be good Christians and we should be good citizens if we can be. But I say all of that to say this, that there is a scriptural orderliness that applies to all of us, that we all have someone, perhaps many, to submit to So it should come as no surprise or really no additional burden when the Bible takes us to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22. If you'd turn there for me, please. Look at a few verses here in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible says, you've heard this verse before, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as unto the Lord. So a wife is to submit herself to her husband. I've just given you a whole long list of things that every one of us has to submit to. This is really no different, but we show our submission to God by the way we submit to civil authority. We show our submission to to God by the way the younger will submit to the elder, and we show our submission to God following the rules even as a wife submits herself to her own husband. Not everybody else's husband, her own husband, by the way. This is not permission for a husband to be domineering or some type of uh, emperor of his house. Verse 23 goes on to explain that to us men, because sometimes they only has to give one verse there in verse 22 to tell the wife, but then there are several verses here to explain that to us rock-headed men. Verse number 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. So the Bible here explains on to the men that, yes, yeah, she's supposed to submit to you just as the church is supposed to submit to Christ, but husband... That means you've got to love her, you've got to love the wife as Jesus Christ loves this church, His church. He died for this church. He gave Himself for this church. He sacrificed everything for this church. And that's the standard that God places upon the husband. And then He tells the wife, Submit yourself to your, to your own husband. Husband, love your wife. Wife, submit. And I think there's a lot of preaching on perhaps wives submitting to their husbands. And I don't think there's enough preaching on husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. That's a sacrificial love. It's a big deal. Now, the Bible says that this is just because she is submitting, it is not permission for a man to be domineering. The Bible even goes on and tells us something very interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you want to turn there, but leave your finger here in Ephesians, we'll be back. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 12, the Bible talks about how even an unbelieving husband can be saved because of the submission of his wife. That even an unbelieving wife can be saved because of the love, Christ-like, sacrificial love of her husband. Now, there are times when people get saved and after they're married. I'll read this passage in a minute, but I was talking to somebody just the other day. Um, Actually, it was Elijah we were talking about, uh, a man that I met in Atlanta. We used to, when I worked in Atlanta, I'd go to church there in Covington, Georgia, and Brother Billy Ingram's church, and there was a man, I just happened to sit in, I came into the auditorium, and there's about four or five sections of church pews. They're a little bit shorter, about the same length. It's a pretty, it's a bigger church, you know, building, and they probably run about 200 or so on a Wednesday night. I got no idea what they run on a Sunday morning. I've only ever been there on a Sunday. No, that's not true. Anyway, anyway, the point is, sorry, get lost in the details. I just walked in that night and sat down in a pew. The man that I was sitting beside, I was just trying not to sit in any new, you know, people sit in the same place. and you know, it's not, I know there's no names on the pews, but, you know, I'm trying not to push anybody out of the place they like to sit in. So I'm just kind of looking around. I find a hole and I set myself down. And then this brother comes in, a little bit older fella comes in and sits down. He's like, ah, hey, how you doing, brother? And he introduced himself. His name was, his name is Brother Campbell. And Brother Campbell, he's a big Atlanta Braves fan. So we talked about baseball for a little while. We talked about how long he'd been. He just, I mean, he is a Georgia man. I mean, he is pure Southern Georgia. And I mean, he hadn't really traveled very far. I don't know. I mean, I guess he's probably been out of the state of Georgia, but He's the kind of person that if you didn't make him, he might never leave the state of Georgia. He's that kind of fella. I sat down there and I talked to him and his wife's not saved. They've been married for 40 years, raised kids. He comes to church faithfully. His wife won't come. I don't know the whole story there. I got the impression that he got saved after they got married, and she never did. And so I prayed for his wife. And I invite you to pray for Brother Campbell's wife as well. But my point is 
that the Bible tells us about that, that this situation can occur. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. The Bible says, But to the rest I speak I, not the, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. What the... What there it doesn't mean that they're automatically saved and that the children are automatically saved. That's not Calvinism there. It's just saying that there, if that wife ever has an opportunity to get saved, guess where it's going to come from? From her believing husband. If that husband ever has an opportunity to be saved, it'll be because that believing wife has been there this whole time. And you know, if those children from that marriage ever get an opportunity to be saved, it'll be because of that believing mama or that believing daddy that took them to church even when the spouse wouldn't come. I mean, the Bible here is talking specifically about these situations. Verse number 15 there says, but if, a, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother and sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, old man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? God covers, the, covers that situation. He says, you know, you are the gospel that the lost sees. You know, the, the old saying is that sometimes we're the only Bible that some people will ever read. That would be even more true in a marriage that is unequally yoked with a lost person and a believer and a saved person. So I want to say this, everyone has someone to submit to. That's scriptural. It's orderly. The Bible also says, among all of the other ways that we are to submit, speak specifically to the wife, that she should submit to her own husband. Finally, as far as looking at verses there, if you're there in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 6.1 Finally tonight, as the order of biological creation, we've covered the husband and the wife, but now let's talk about children. Children, Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Children are told to submit to their parents. And much like when the Bible tells us, tells the wife to submit to her own husband, and then goes on to tell the husbands to love their wives, the Bible here in chapter 6 tells the children to submit to their parents, and then has a special message to us fathers in verse number 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Children must not be allowed to run the home, and fathers are admonished to not provoke them to wrath. Now, <laughs> heard a story once about, well, I won't spend the time. What if you just randomly spanked a child? Didn't ever tell them what to do, didn't ever tell them what not to do, just randomly spanked them. Do you think maybe that they would understand what the rules were? No. Do you think maybe that they would just simply be provoked to wrath? Yeah. Do you think that maybe by the time they're 18 years old that they would be so mad and so bitter that they would be willing and ready to just leave home and never look back? Absolutely. That's what the Bible's talking about in provoking to wrath. Fathers, we must be gentle. We must be patient. We must be stern and strict. There is no compromise here, but 
we must remember how God treats us when we sin. There is an original orderliness that we see in the Bible. There is a biological orderliness that we understand simply from looking around. There is a scriptural orderliness in the family that God very carefully and in many places points out to us. And finally, there is a preferential orderliness, and that is that the priorities must be kept in our relationships. Priorities Our preferential, our priorities must be kept in relationships, and that is this. For me, I'll tell you what my priorities are. I don't always succeed, but these are my priorities. My relationship with God has to come first. If I can't keep up with my relationship with God, none of the other relationships in my life matter. It won't work. I'm just trying to do things in the flesh. It won't work. I've got to maintain a close relationship with God. My second relationship and priority is with my wife. The kids will grow up and leave the house. But she's my wife until death do us part. She's the most important relationship in my life. Secondly is my or thirdly rather is my relationship with the kids. It's vitally important. It is what God has given me to do. Fourthly, in my case, is my relationship as the pastor of this church. But I've got to keep my priorities in check. I've got to keep my priorities carefully kept. That is my preferential orderliness. And I try to be orderly in that when I pray. I try to be orderly in that when I act. I try to be orderly in when I serve because a family requires orderliness. God is the God of order and homes must be orderly. Let's stand for a short time of invitation. We will uh, sing a song, Just As I Am, number 270. And after a word of prayer, if you want to do business with the Lord, now's the time. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for... Lord, the family, thank you for my wife, I thank you for my children, I thank you for this church, but Father, I most of all thank you for Jesus Christ. He is my Savior, and Lord, I thank you for changing my life so that I can see the order that you have placed in everything. Father, thank you for revealing it to us. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing number 270, Just As I Am. If you need to do business with the Lord, now's your time. people said amen well okay we'll pray for brother uh barker they're heading back from labelle after he preaches tonight so he's preaching in labelle so uh, pray for them as they travel um i also uh, do pray for the hope ministry and these new videos that brother carter's working on that'll be real good and uh, do continue to pray for our faith promise and uh, do whatever god asks you to do in the matters of faith promise and we will be back here again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock and uh, be back. I think it's the last. No, I think, we, I think we're starting the book of Titus Wednesday night. Oh, we just had the last one. All right, I got my. Okay, so we're starting the book of Titus on Wednesday night. Praise God. All right, so let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Evan, will you lead us in prayer, please?